she wasn't born yesterday for women who are 40 plus fabulous by the emptiness chicks i'm janet evans ex mnc sachi advertising creative who have won numerous radio and tv awards not that that'll affect us because we're doing a podcast and i'm dr amelia haynes who has been a medical doctor for 30 years and specializing in sexual health and mental health and relationships, you know, and I'm generally a very useful human being. Well, you know, we'll find out about that, but <laughs> we are here to work together. People tell me on good authority uh, that I am. Really? <laughs> yes, well, they never say that to me, so I think we're the perfect hosts for She Wasn't Born Yesterday. We never shy away from the tough topics, do we? No. We like a bit of a tough topic. And today we are going to be talking about quite a confronting topic, but a very important topic. And this does affect women who are 40 plus, fabulous as well, but also actually across the board, women of all ages, obviously, because we're going to be talking about escaping domestic violence. And the idea, of course, is what's the best way to support women and children in domestic violence situations have you ever known anybody in a domestic violence situation personally? Um, we, well, yes, I suppose mm-hmm. both personally and professionally, which mm-hmm. is no surprise seeing as it's one out of four of us, I think. Yes, mm. oh, yes, I read that step during the week that, in fact, in Australia, on average, one woman a week is murdered by her current or former partner, which means there's 52 women a year. But, I mean... These aren't just numbers. These are people. These are individuals who are loved by families, by huge circles of people. It's just incredibly devastating. I have had a personal um, experience with domestic violence myself because my sister was going out with a guy who had bipolar disorder. Illness. Illness. Yeah, yeah. And, And when he didn't take his meds, he was just sort of off off the planet and unfortunately she sort of stuck with him because she thought she could help him um and support him which was a wonderful sentiment and he would sort of erode her little by little if he was not feeling well so he would tell her that she was flirting with a musician at some yeah. gig they went to and she'd be don't be ridiculous and he was very sort of paranoid about that but they were moving house ironically they were moving in together the day they were moving it was in Brisbane, massively hot, hectic, stressful. Their ute broke down. They ended up at midnight arriving at the place, just clutter everywhere. And uh, they had a huge argument about something and he just pushed her violently against a wall. Yeah. And she just lost it. She ran out, called the police. Bizarrely, a close relative of ours turned up. She's a detective in Brisbane. Yeah. Turned up at the scene and it was um, and took her to a safe place. This sort of happened early in their relationship and it it did escalate because she tried to get a restraining order on him, which didn't work because he let down all the tyres in her car in the car park where she worked. And and also maliciously they had a she had a piano and was on the veranda where they were moving to, supposedly moving in together. They never did. But he bent back every single individual key on the piano, yeah. you know, inside the piano, which is incredible. But she couldn't prove it because she didn't have any evidence. But so that just sort of shows you that I suspect that a lot of women have a lot of personal experience with domestic violence, even if it's not them themselves. Today, to talk about this issue and what can be done about it, and not just about women in this situation, but also the children who might be involved, uh, we have two incredible guests. And we're very excited today to talk to Jenny Woodhouse and Justine O'Malley. Jenny and Justine, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. Well, just to give you a little bit of background on them, Jenny's a pastoral care coordinator with the Church Missionary Society of New South Wales and ACT, and formerly chaplain of the Sydney Anglican Church's Professional Standards Unit. Justine, you're a social worker and counsellor, and you have over 30 years experience working with children and young people, specialising in supporting children's social and emotional development, especially kids aged 3 to 13 years. The first thing we might want to clarify perhaps with you Jenny is what exactly is the difference between domestic violence domestic abuse coercive control family violence just the small questions Jenny (laughs) just just to kick us off or are they sort of all really the same thing 
I would say they're all really the same thing. It's been extended to uh, away from the word violence out to abuse. Violence, I think, conjures up for us the sense of physical violence, uh, whereas domestic abuse is more largely um, emotional, psychological abuse. So it's a broader term. Family violence is, uh, I guess, broadens it out even more to include abuse against kids. And any child witnessing domestic abuse Uh, is also one of the victims of the abuse, whether they're directly uh, being abused or not. Coercive control uh, will be next year in New South Wales, at least, will be um, against the law. So coercive control is recognising more more of the concept of emotional, psychological abuse against people and describing more of uh, what that means and pulling it away from what we would traditionally think of as physical violence. It was interesting because you mentioned um, children in that in that description, but um, Justine, this is your particular special specialist area, isn't it, uh, working with children who have experienced domestic violence? Yes, and the latest statistics that have come out of the Australian Childhood Maltreatment Study that was released in April of this year tell us that almost 40% of children in Australia are exposed to family and domestic violence before they're 18. Hmm. That's creeping up to almost half of our children in Australia will have an exposure to family and domestic violence in their own homes. That's an incredible amount. Yeah, that is extraordinary. Wow. Does yeah. it, so does that mean that almost 50% of homes have a domestic violence element in them? At some point they will have exposure to that. So absolutely. We're, we're looking at now one in four women will experience physical or sexual abuse, but that's not including the coercive control. Yeah. So when you add coercive control into that statistic, absolutely, we are looking at extremely high numbers. Incredible. Is this actually rising or is this just being noticed more? Is there just more awareness around this at the moment? Look, probably a little bit of both. We are recognising things like coercive control, especially we've learnt a lot um, from the public sharing of Hannah's Clark's story from Queensland, a lot better understanding around coercive control and an understanding that our first responders, our police, uh, you know, social workers, everyone working with families and communities need to have a better understanding of coercive control and not to dismiss that uh, because, um, you know, previously, unless, as you were saying, Jenny, you know, the link was often more around the physical abuse and if there wasn't, you know, Uh, visible bruises, then perhaps um, it may have gone unnoticed or minimised or dismissed. Yeah. So what what is actually coercive control? How how would you define that? Yeah. So probably one of the things we can do is think about what some of the red flags of coercive control are, Mm. because this both helps us to understand from a professional context, but also uh, as, you know, women with friends, uh, if you see some of these red flags, they're things that you can start to have a discussion with. Uh, They're things that you can open the doors to discussion and say, I'm here, I'm here to listen. Um, So things like uh, probably often starts with the love bombing. You know, people may say, but, you know, that's wonderful to have someone that's, you know, you know, sending you flowers and ringing you every minute of the day and wants to spend all their time with you. But when this happens within the first week of a relationship and they're talking about marriage and having children together and mm. I've never wanted to be with anyone but you. And in fact, they were saying all of this to someone else a month ago and that someone mm. else a month prior to that. That's what we refer to as love bombing. So it's something to raise the antennas. It's kind of that first red flag. Um, The monitoring of activity is also a really strong part of coercive control. So it's wanting to control and know what your partner is doing every moment of the day. Uh, It may be actually using surveillance. So we have a lot of technology abuse. And when we talk about the increase, technology, whilst there's lots of amazing and wonderful things that technology can do for us in 2023, it unfortunately has also increased the ability for someone to monitor someone, whether it's that they're tracking them on their phone 
known, known or unknown, whether it's they're placing something on their car, all of those sorts of things. So they're really wanting to monitor what they're doing. They're also isolating them from their support. So again, they're wanting to control. We talk about that coercively controlling someone. They're wanting to stop them from having connections with those people in their lives that previously would have been able to perhaps see red flags or would have had the opportunity to talk with them. So stopping them from seeing their friends and their family by saying, you don't need anyone else. You've got me. Mm. We've got this special connection. You don't need to go and see your mum or Mm. you don't need to hang out with your friends. Why would you hang out with your friends? I really feel really sad that you don't want to spend the Friday night with me. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of that manipulative type of, of, uh, you know, in the initial stages of the relationship then it really might be starting to withdraw that love. So it's the little love bombing at the beginning, but then starting to withdraw. It might be that name calling, that really severe criticism. Controlling the finances is, again, a really big red flag. Mm. And so, uh, you know, a lot of what we look at in supporting women is things like, you know, being able to have a driver's licence and be able to go for, you know, driving lessons. You know, for some women, that's what's, you know, a prohibitive factor because they don't have access to money to be able to do that. Um, controlling everything that they spend the money on, you know, whether even it's for the household or for, you know, personal, you know, items for themselves or the children. But they're really controlling all aspects, controlling their ability to go to work. So a lot of families that I've worked with, uh, the women have not been allowed to work. And it's rarely said that I don't want you to work because I want to control you. It's more that you don't need to work. I'll provide for you. You can stay home. The reason behind it is actually to be able to control the finances. The jealous and the accusations. So, you know, when when they're out and about, it's, um, you know, saying that they've looked at somebody or that, you know, obviously, you know, you've got your phone next to you because you're expecting a phone call from someone. So it's, you know, that regular ongoing. And this all then becomes part of gaslighting. And that's another really important term for us to be aware of because it's making the the victim survivor actually question themselves. You know, did I look at somebody when I was in the shopping centre? So now when they're in the shopping centre, they look to the ground the entire time because they've started to actually question themselves. Uh, Regulating their sexual relationship. You know, it may be that they're forcing them to have sex every single day. You know, there's no pleasure or, you know, enjoyment for um, the female in this this sexual activity. Definitely control. This all then loops back to um, what's portrayed, I should say, in pornography is very often very male-dominated, um, controlling, no pleasure for a female. And that's often replicated, which is unfortunately what a lot of our young people are getting their messages about sexuality from. That's where they're learning about sexuality sexuality is through pornography. We had a young girl say to us recently in one of our um, healthy relationships training, I really don't want to have sex because I don't want to be strangled. She actually thought it was a requirement of sex was that you have to be strangled because that's what they're seeing in pornography. Mm. And then probably the last one that I'll just say around the coercive control is actually manipulating and threatening children and and pets. So, um, you know, if you ever think of leaving me, you know, as one of my young women that, that I've worked with said, was told, you know, you'll be leaving in a box and you'll never see your children again. They may actually encourage the purchase of pets because they know that will be something else they can manipulate and use against um, the female. A lot of shelters aren't able to take pets in, so that's often, you know, one of the prohibitive factors, you know, of many, but can be one of those prohibitive factors to actually leaving the home is because the fear of leaving your pet behind. Actually, in WA, they're looking at creating it with the RSPCA, a a program so that pets can go there so that women can leave and, and actually go into a shelter yeah so they're just, well, they're just a few to, you know parts of the mm. course of control but it's it's very slow that it happens and that's the problem just hearing you talk just then it's a terrible terrible list I think a lot of us um hearing this or certainly me right now I'm thinking how does anyone actually leave you know when people say mm-hmm. why don't why don't people just leave like mm-hmm. that's terrible why don't they just go um I mean certainly you know that list explains a lot of why people find it so hard in fact I think why does anyone actually ever manage um to disconnect and and leave yeah and I I was actually going to ask you now Jen what, what can be the crunch time that actually makes or, or for both of you to answer but what is the kind of clinching point where someone goes oh you know I can't do this anymore uh, I need to get out of here 
like for my sister, it was quite a sort of obvious and sudden eruption into into physical violence. But if this sort of coercive control and, and subtle, it sounds quite subtle manipulation is happening and gradually escalating over time, then how does it get to the point where you think, I need to find help and get out? Well, it's not just one point. I think it's actually several points. In fact, on average, um, in Australia at least, women leave on average about five, six times and, and keep going back. So it's uh, it, the, the gaslighting is really significant and that's a brilliant description that Justine's given us of gaslighting. Um, so and because it's so subtle and because you do start to second guess yourself and your example, Justine, was good of someone looking, you know, being accused of looking around a shopping centre so she just looks down now and starts to second guess her own motives and then am I going mad or am I what he says I am, which is I'm, you know, a horrible, selfish person and I just never support him well enough. Oh, I better get better at supporting him. For many years a woman can actually just be on the trajectory of I need to improve myself so that I can be a better wife to him or a better partner to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when she starts to, to to get a bit of an inkling that it can't actually be all my fault um, because she will be blamed for everything. Um, he won't be apologising for anything. She will be doing the apologising and taking the blame and responsibility for so much. After however many years down the track that it is, it's often when kids start to press his buttons and, and let's just like continue on talking about he being a perpetrator and she being a victim because yeah. statistically speaking that's basically what it is. But it can be mm. the other way around. Yeah. Um, mm. But if one of the when the kids get old enough to start pressing the buttons or, you know, he has to take a bit of responsibility for disciplining kids or whatever it might be, that's often when a woman starts is starting to think, hold on, that no, that's not fair. If it's not fair for my kids, it hasn't been fair for me. And she might start to put a bit of a toe in the water with friends. Oh, what does your husband do this? Does your husband do that? Right. Yeah. If she gets a good response or an understanding response, she can go a bit further with those conversations. Often and over many, many years, she's been getting responses that are particularly unhelpful, can I say. Mm -hmm. um, having heard many of these responses, it's been like, oh, he said what? Um, so <laughs> it, that will just shove her straight back into her self-doubt again and she'll go on for another couple of years in self-doubt before she might put a toe in the water again. It's often when um, she actually comes to understand that she cannot be to blame for everything that a woman will start then to reach out for more serious assistance. And it's not necessarily assistance to leave him by any means because if I can just explain it to him in the right way or I can just say it in the right tone of voice or if I just wait for the right time and mm. explain to him how I'm feeling, he'll understand and then he'll change and he'll, you know, and we'll be able to get along. So that's usually what she starts asking for help in and it's then a bit further down the track that she might try leaving and, and often it's let's have a break, let's have a break for a few months and surely that will, you know, smack in between the eyes surely you'll get it then that I'm serious about this and then she'll go back and it'll start all over again so yep it's many points the thing that scares me about what Jenny was just saying was that so many people in society and you know I'm sure I'm sure that Justine has seen that this as well that so many people who come into contact with these women, of whom we know now there is just such a huge proportion. Mm. But the people who come into contact will actually reinforce how they're kind of soothing the whole situation, saying it's their fault, because people will just reinforce that idea that if you just talk to him, basically a rational person would understand. So there'll be a lot of reinforcing from friends and family and, you know, even you know, half friends. Yeah, I yeah. guess it's what goes on behind closed doors isn't always obvious to to people. So they might look at this guy and go, oh, how could this be happening? Like he seems so respectable. He's such a lovely guy. Everyone loves him. And, and definitely perpetrators groom not just the victim survivor but everyone around them. And you right. know, that was definitely, a, you know, a point that's come out of, you know, Hannah Clark's situation mm. where, 
he was a you know appeared on the surface to be a, a respectful and personable person so given the benefit of the doubt of not coming in after breaching the restraining order and of course um, he then took that opportunity to end her life and the life of her children mm. uh, and so um, you know recognizing that that's people can on the surface actually appear to be someone that's personable but in fact um, they're not a nice guy who sometimes abuses someone they're an abuser who can actually fake being a nice guy but with that shame I think you said about other people saying you know if you just do this or do that it will work out yeah. that layer of shame um, for a, a victim survivor to say you know I should be able to do this and when you add layers like uh, perhaps you know uh, multicultural cultural you know yes. expectations of families that um, once you marry you stay and you make it work then that can yeah. be another added factor that that level of shame um, also just yeah. that response um, so that we talk about the fight flight and freeze response but we also know there's the fawn trauma response and that becomes a learned response um, just to you know keep your head down and uh, you know not make any waves and and just continue on in that way but also the financial so you know as we said often part of the process is to restrict access to finances uh, we know that in every state in Australia it's almost impossible to get a rental you know your choices are really narrow and slim to actually physically set up house somewhere else and it you know always seems absurd that the person who's the victim survivor tends to be the person who you know ends up having to leave and and so looking at you know staying at home um, services and and I'm sure in lots of other states they have those as well where the victim survivor is actually the person that stays at home and the person who's actually perpetrating the abuse is the person that needs to move on. I had a family where the option was there to move into a, a refuge but it was two hours away from their current location it meant the yeah. children would have to leave school it meant that you know the um, victim survivor would actually have to leave her you know small uh, but you know important um, safety net of supporters so when she looked at all those options you know rooting her children up who had already gone through a lot of you know trauma being away from the you know the only people she felt connected to she made the choice to, to stay and you know these are all real real implications for women. Yes personally I have someone who was experiencing domestic violence and they decided to end the marriage, but because he controlled all the finances, he immediately cut off all of her access to any money at all mm. and she became homeless. And this was absolutely shocking and there were children involved as well. But one thing I, I, I want to ask you, Justine, is what happens when children um, are exposed to domestic violence? What actually happens to them? They're really aware of what is going on. They often feel fearful, but they also, you know, have a real lot of mixed emotions because, you know, they, they love the people involved here. They love mum and dad, but they feel very fearful for what has happened. They also, um, it becomes really normalised to think about having to call the police, about having the police coming in the night time. Even when physical violence isn't happening to mum, it might be having to the property around. So mum's phone's regularly smashed, property is damaged, windows are broken. And so they're constantly walking on eggshells. They are constantly fearful of what might, um, you know, use, use the term Jenny, pre you know, pressing someone's buttons and so you know mum may be saying you know we've got to be good we've got to be well behaved so that creates that fawn response often in children where they think if I just be good then mum and dad won't fight so it really you know creates that trauma response um, when we look at things like the ACEs study the adverse childhood experiences study we know that you know the long-term potential impact for children who experience adverse experiences like witnessing family and domestic violence can have a whole lot of implications as they move through their teenage years and into adulthood, right down to, you know, physical symptoms that they may experience. But we know that, you know, mental health issues will definitely, you know, increase in the likelihood of children who are witnessing family and domestic violence. So they may exhibit, you know, pain-based behaviours as they go through their teenage years. And it may be that this is the only uh, example of a relationship they've seen. It might be what they've seen in pornography and what they've seen in their home. So unfortunately, when they then look at relationships for themselves, they may never have actually experienced what a healthy relationship looks like. And so that's why healthy relationship uh, education is so important in our school systems for all of our children, for children who have experienced family domestic violence, but also for our broader primary intervention of every single child who will eventually be our adults of the future. 
you're currently working with children yeah. um, to try and not only protect protect them, is that right? But educate them yes. as to why this is wrong and the right kind of behaviours? Absolutely. So in a couple of my roles, I do primary prevention. So with my role with WA Child Safety Services, we are able to support schools with their healthy and respectful relationship education. So we do work directly with children, but also supporting teachers and staff. And then I do secondary and, and tertiary intervention in my, you know, private practice work, um, counselling with children in my social work role who have already experienced uh, that impact of family and domestic violence. And how do they come to you? Are they referred by someone or? Yeah, so um, when it's primary prevention, it's for every single child. So, um, you know, that's through our protective behaviours type um, programs in school settings. So every single child should get that information. And then um, with children who have uh, already witnessed family and domestic violence. Um, so in my particular role in, in private practice, there may be referrals through child protection. It may be referrals through family violence shelters and then I'm also a, a social worker in a school so um, that may be through children actually uh, starting to you know exhibit a range of changes in their behaviour and that may be because of what they're experiencing at home. Yeah. Actually I was just thinking that with um, the more subtle you know if dad or mum hits the other the other parent that's more obvious mm. but once again with the more subtle things like um coercive control it's a lot for a child to even conceptualize that mm. um to understand yeah yeah, yeah. So how do and they... It's that walking on eggshells. It's that yeah, constant yeah, yeah. fear that mm. something I do or say or something mum or d might say is going to set dad off. The other thing that um, with many of the the women that I've worked with over the years, um, they will say things like the father would, you know, even at the dinner table, engage the children against the mum. Oh, isn't she silly? Isn't mum a duffer? Uh, look how dumb mum is. Isn't she ridiculous? And so the, the, the family dynamic gets set up uh, quite early on as well, that it's dad and the kids are all the smart ones and mum's the dumb one. And maybe even turn the children against mum. Yeah. But is there is their goal to get the kids to be with him or just to pick on that one controlling. Control. It's all about power and control. Control. But why is it? What what is it about these guys that that makes them want to control someone or a situation. Janice has just demonstrated it very nicely that um when Jenny says what she just said, um you know, sensible human beings like Janet will mm. think, but they must be, you know, they must be thinking these things at the front of their brain. They must be act like th the thoughts come into their brain and they're acting on it really knowingly. And I was going to say, I would love to hear from um, the two of you because, you know, I, I don't want to just hear the sound of my own voice, but I was going to say, I'm particularly interested in, in this kind of characteristic of people. So, Please speak on. <laughs> I mean, we would say that, that domestic violence is a choice because very often these perpetrators, they're not doing this in the same way in their workplace. They're making a choice to not do that there. Uh, so, you know, it is a choice. And whilst absolutely drugs and alcohol can exacerbate it, without a doubt, it's making sure we're not being able to blame it on things like drugs and alcohol. You know, again, one of the, you know, the, the primary interventions needs to be the understanding around the distinct gender drivers for intimate partner violence, um, for violence against women, because um, I think, as, as Jenny said, you know, there's, there is um, a level of acceptance of violence against women. You know, just like I said, with, in pornography, um, it tends to be the male dominating and violent towards the female. And people are just accepting that that is okay. The acceptance of that decision making and, and limiting women's independence, the rigid ge gender stereotyping, which yes, we have had a you know small move towards changes, and a whole nother I'm sure hours of discussion around the Barbie movie, which I loved. Uh, but um, you know, in that you know there was people you know horrified. You know, why was the whole you know CEO team you know depicted to be male? Well, actually, in Australia. Of the 200 uh, top companies in Australia, there's only 14 female CEOs. So that's actually is we haven't moved 
anywhere near far enough to represent women, you know, in independent, you know, decision making in public life and relationships. And we still have a massive gender inequality. So when you really nut down to primary intervention, it's, you know, having that better understanding as a whole community around the impact of gender inequality on family and domestic violence. And until we make those changes, so, you know, I'd really recommend people to, to look at our watch and the Ch- Let's Change the Story framework um, around primary intervention and, and uh, gender inequality, because as a whole community, we need to make those changes. Hmm. So is education um, of across the board yes. of everybody, adults and children? Yeah, um, everybody, everybody. One of the, yeah, right. And, and men and women. Yeah. 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 And it is, you know, um, Jen, we talk about family violence. Um, you know, it's actually, you know, and a lot of the campaigns will talk about it. it is a men's issue, as in men need to get on board and have an understanding around this. And, and it can't, you know, it can't be all about the victim survivors having to do something different. Um, it's about all of us. And, ev- you know, everywhere about being a, a respectful, healthy relationships and communication, um, we still have a long way to go. And a lot of the messaging is really around uh, women. If you find yourself in this situation, uh, or if you, you know, if you recognise uh, that you're being treated this way, then get out. That's actually putting the onus on the person who's being victimised to to do it. Uh, the yeah. messaging really needs to be shifted to men. <laughs> Just stop it. Yeah. Yeah. I wish it was that simple. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure Justine and Jenny wish it was that yeah. simple too. Hey, if you could wave your magic wands and just revolutionise um, the world, let alone Australia, overnight, what sort of things would you do? Like what would you institute? You've got all the money in the world. What would you bring in? So I think it would be at all levels. It needs to be at primary, secondary and tertiary. So for primary, uh, education around healthy risk, for relationships, not in a tick the box way, but actually in depth across curriculum, age appropriate across all year levels. Uh, for that secondary, so uh, more targeted services for our vulnerable groups, Aboriginal women, women with disabilities, more targeted services, and tertiary to continue. Uh, and you know it is happening, but you know there needs to be more uh, services that are appropriate and uh, involving the voice of victim survivors uh, for women that. Have have experienced as well as that training and understanding for those first responders that are going to respond to tertiary, so training and for police and, and others um, around things like coercive control. Hmm. I'd agree with that. Um, I would throw money at you, Justine. Um, that would be fantastic. <laughs> the other thing to say is when uh, working with women who are finding themselves in these very, very difficult relationships and not really knowing what to do, they're, they're quite powerless um, and feeling like they have no option. I've, I've just got to stay here. I, I can't afford to move out. I've got nowhere to go. There are, there are no options out there. And one of the things that I, I do with women is actually to help them think through what their options are. And their options, the, it generally comes down to three options. You can stay, carry on as you are, and we'll cart you off in a straitjacket in a year or two. Uh, you could leave um, let's talk about where you could go and how you could get some money, and that's really quite difficult. Or you can stay in the relationship and just work out how you're going to protect yourself emotionally from this. Um, but, you know, once you start to protect yourself emotionally in a relationship, you're removing the emotional punching bag away from this fellow, and he's not going to like that. And so often his behaviour ramps up. So they're not great options. So I think I would be um, pouring money into giving women options. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Options. We yeah. want money and options. Money and options. Yeah. <laughs> and so if someone comes to you um, and says, oh, you know, my, my, my partner says that he wants to control all of our finances, but that's because he's really good with money, and, you know, it's, he's caring for me, but I've just got a little bit of a feeling inside that something's not quite right. What could we do as friends and supporters who may not have seen any of this behind the scenes kind of behaviour? How can we support other women? So, so we can just say we're here for you. I'm, I'm here. Please keep talking to me about, you know, when you're getting these warning signs about what's going on. Um, if at any point you uh, feel unsafe, um, let's think about a, a, a safety plan. So, you know, encouraging perhaps, you know, if they're getting to the point where they're starting to feel, you know, un, unsafe, uh, packing a bag with important documents, having access to, um, you know, things that they might need, packing, uh, you know, photocopying things, having a bag at someone else's house, 
putting them in contact, you know, even if it's 1-800-RESPECT um, as a starting point, that then, which is a national line, which then could put them into contact with local services. Um, but really saying, I'm here for you. I listen, I'm listen. i listening to you. I see you. I believe you. And I'm not going anywhere. And even if they make it difficult for you to see me, we'll work out ways that we can do that. Just don't leave your friend because they have to can't they cancel the night out and um, you know they don't come and see you as much as they used to don't stop seeing them they need you now more than ever yeah yeah incredible and uh, I guess it, the same applies to the guys too if they kind of hear about something a bit amiss about a call, friend call of theirs, a male friend of theirs yeah, yeah. To call it out don't, maybe, don't don't let that behavior yeah. and don't just laugh laugh it off um yeah. call it out and yeah. call it out there's been some really great television ads um around that where you know role models how you can call things out so again more public campaigns around that is important as well yeah well advertising being an advertising we should be, get behind that absolutely <laughs> yes you should there is you know quite obviously in chatting to you like just so so very much that still needs to be done oh yeah because it goes so deep yeah. it goes so deep I can't yeah. believe it's so prevalent i mean 40 percent mm. and that's only what we know of. yes yeah. exactly mm. because i mean with my sister for example she i only found out about all of this after it had happened mm. because she was probably not ashamed but but just knew that i wouldn't probably approve of the movie in together i would have advised her against it and also she probably did feel i don't know like you know she was not doing the most well advised thing so yeah she just didn't ever come to me for support which i was devastated at as well mm. shame is a really big part of it shame is a huge yeah, part of it. right a huge part and shame links into our brains uh, straight to our fight flight system uh so you you want to avoid shame <laughs> that's the that's an emotion to avoid it's debilitating so when a woman starts to feel shame that she's being treated in a way that she doesn't mm, maybe it's not quite right i don't really know or believe in the gaslighting. I am really dumb. I'm bad at relationships. I can't actually support a man. I just, uh, there's so much shame and so much um, fear around. But if somebody says to me, uh, you know, he's not a good husband, my goodness, what on earth do you do then? Uh, I, I, I can't, I can't look after myself. I can't get enough money. I can't, I can't even go there. Thank you so much for shedding some light on this this uh, very serious topic and uh, a very, you know, challenging issue that we have. Quite obviously, the conversation is enormous and this is but a speck. And it's not just women 40 plus, obviously, but all women and children as well. And it's just been incredible to have you But it's worried grandmas as well. So yes. I was going to say thank yes. you both. This has been fantastic. Mm. Mm. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Gorgeye, thanks for listening in today. We hope you enjoyed this ep. But we'd really love to hear more from you. We'd love to know exactly what you actually think of us and our guests. So if you're on Spotify, you can rate us. We love stars. And on Apple Pods, write us a little blurb. Let us know what you think and hopefully we can keep going. Apple loves their algorithms and we love you. So thanks for listening. We really enjoy your company. See you next week on She Wasn't Born Yesterday.